Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Keck, and the goal of this little video is just to give you a bit of an introduction to the lab experiment you'll be carrying out on the titrations and, and stoichiometry of the reaction between potassium permanganate and potassium oxalate. I have written the reaction up here on the board. So you see in this reaction, two permanganate ions react with five oxalate ions in the presence of acid to form products. So in this particular experiment then, you will not only be refining your titration technique, but you'll have an opportunity to work with a reaction that has a stoichiometry that's other than the one-to-one -one stoichiometry. So this makes this titration a little bit different than the ones that you may have done last year involving acids and bases, which typically occur with a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. So in the titrations that you may have done in the past, the acid-base titrations, uh, you typically would put some acid in an Erlenmeyer flask, put a standard base in the burette, and then carry out the titration in the presence of an indicator. In this reaction, we're going to do a similar thing. The differences are that it won't be an acid in the flask, it will be a known oxalate solution. That is, a solution of oxalate that I've made where we know exactly what the concentration is. In the burette, we'll put an unknown permanganate solution. So we know what approximately what the concentration is, but our goal is to determine that concentration much more precisely. Also, because the permanganate solution is purple, we already have a built-in indicator. That is, the permanganate solution in the burette is purple. As it reacts with the oxalate, it generates a colorless product. And so as long as there's oxalate left in the flask, the color should disappear as the permanganate reacts away. But as soon as we've consumed all of the oxalate, the permanganate no longer has anything to react with, therefore the purple color will persist and we know that we've reached the end point of our titration. The other difference between this titration and ones that you have perhaps done before is that for various reasons that we won't get into now, this titration has to be carry out, carried out at an elevated temperature, typically in the 60 to 80 degree C range. So we've got to warm our solution before we do the titration. All right, so let's begin. Our standard solution, potassium oxalate, I've made to a known concentration of 0 0.10 molar, and I've done that gravimetrically. That is, I've weighed out very precisely a known amount of the material and dissolved it up to a certain volume in water so that I know what the concentration is. Now, we want to measure out a volume of this material very precisely, because if we know the volume and we know the concentration, we can then determine the total number of moles of the oxalate solution that we've used. So I'm going to do that using this graduated pipette. Now you've done some pipetting before, uh, but it's always good to review pipetting technique. Uh, my preference is to use one of these pipette bulbs because what we want to do is use the bulb only to draw the solution up into the pipette, as you'll see here. So I'm going to take some of my oxalate solution, and we never want to stick any type of a device into our stock bottle. So I'm going to take some of the solution, and I'm going to pour it into a separate flask. Then I can dispense from that solution. There, that way, if my pipette happens to be contaminated, or I do something else silly, I've only contaminated this small amount and I haven't contaminated my stock bottle. Okay. So I'm going to put the bulb onto the pipette and I want to do that fairly lightly because I'm going to want to take it off quickly afterwards. Okay. So you squeeze the bulb, then stick the pipette into the solution, and then we're going to draw the solution up and we're going to want to pipette 10 milliliters. So I want to take that all the way to the top, a little above the top, then I'm going to just take the bulb off and use my finger to stop the flow of the reagent. Now, when we use a pipette, notice that the graduations on the pipette run from 0 to 10 in 1 mil increments, and then beyond that, there are smaller graduation marks every one tenth of a milliliter. When you deliver a solution using a pipette, we're delivering by difference. So, for example, if I wanted to deliver 3 milliliters, I could set this at any mark I wanted. Let's say I set it at 0, and then I could just run it down to the 3 line and then I would be done. In this case I want to deliver 10 milliliters. So I'm going to drop it down to the zero mark 
and you want to line it up and be it may take a couple of times to practice this because this is actually a little bit tricky but you want to let it go down slowly until the bottom of the meniscus is exactly sitting on the zero line like that knock the last drop off of the bottom and now we're going to move it into our other flask and we're just going to let gravity do the work and it can go kind of quickly at first but again once we get down close to 10 we want to start slowing it down a little bit with our finger at the top because we want to stop it exactly at the 10 mark and so notice I'm slowing down quite a bit we're going drop by drop until I get down exactly to the 10 milliliter line right there bottom of the meniscus sitting on the line and now I've delivered exactly 10 milliliters of this solution into my flask and because I know exactly what the volume is I know exactly what the concentration is I can now calculate exactly the number of moles of oxalate I put in there that will be important as you will see soon now next thing notice that in our balanced chemical reaction the reaction requires acid in order to proceed it requires hydrogen ion so I've got to put some of those in there our goal here is not to put a precisely defined amount in there we just want a large excess because it takes quite a few it takes 16 hydrogen ions for every two permanganates and five oxalates so I'm just going to put in a large excess of hydrogen ion in order to do that I have made up a six molar sulfuric acid solution and I'm going to put about a milliliter of that solution into my reaction I'll do that using this small disposable transfer pipette it's graduated the graduations are hard to see but filling up to the top of the neck here is about one milliliter so I'm going to take about one milliliter again the amount is, of that is not critical and I'm going to put that into my solution in order to provide those hydrogen ions now I'm going to add some additional water this is just plain distilled water and that's to give me a little bit more volume and help me see things the amount again really isn't too critical just a little bit there and then I'm gonna warm this up now to warm it I've set up a water bath in advance this thing needs to be at somewhere between 60 and 80 degrees we probably want to be closer to the 80 degree side because it's going to cool as the titration proceeds so I'm going to set this over here in the water bath and just let it sit in there for a few minutes to warm up and I've got a thermometer so I'll check the temperature and make sure that that it gets there while that's going I'm going to set up my burette and remember we're going to put the permanganate solution in the burette when you use a burette you want to make sure before you start that the stopcock is closed and that everything down here is tight these burettes they have interchangeable parts sometimes those parts come loose if they come loose during your experiment that's a mess so make sure that everything is on tight make sure that the stopcock is closed then we're going to put a little bit of the permanganate solution in the burette just to rinse it out get any dust or anything like that out of it um, then we'll empty it and then we'll fill it up and, and we'll be ready to begin the experiment putting solutions into a burette different people do it different ways if you have a very steady hand you can maybe pour it directly in some people like to use a funnel uh, I'll show you the way that I like to do it again we'll get a little bit of this stuff we'll put it into a separate beaker it's much easier to pour out of a beaker and if you have a steady hand and I like to think mine is somewhat steady you can just pour it straight in okay so I'm gonna pour a few milliliters in there not very much and the purpose again is just to rinse dust or anything that might be in there out and so you tilt it almost horizontally and just spin it around a little bit coat the inside of the burette with the reagent which we call the titrant and then we get rid of it and so this is going to be discarded so I'm just going to discard that into this other beaker we'll do that through the stopcock and we'll let it flow out
Okay. Now we'll fill the burette for real. And again, let me show you one more technique that we can use for that. Some people like to use the funnel. It's not my preference. More implements used means more stuff to clean. I don't like cleaning funnels. So a nice way to pour is to use a stir rod. Okay, so you can pour down the stir rod like this. And that helps And I'm going to fill this burette to near the top. I'm not going to fill exactly to the top. We don't need to. Your fill needs to be below the zero line at the top. It's a better idea not to shoot for exactly zero. Why is that? Because if we're shooting for a particular target, we're often predisposed to think that we've hit that target. It is better to just fill to somewhere near the top and then objectively read the point to which we filled. And again, since volumes are measured by difference, it doesn't matter. Zero minus five is the same as one minus six. So it's, it's not critical what we fill it to. Now the other thing that we want to do, notice the tip down here has air bubbles in it. We want to make sure we get all of that out. That can, that can change or, or alter our our volumes in an irregular way. The easiest way to get that out is just to put a waste beaker underneath and let some of the liquid flow until the bubble is gone. You want to make sure that all of the air bubble is gone from the tip of your burette. Okay, let's check our temperature and see if our solution here is ready to go. Stick the thermometer right in there. And well, it's warming up, that's a good sign. We are getting up above 75 degrees, pretty close to 80. So I think that'll be just fine. And okay, so let's take our oxalate solution out of the water bath. Now, the thermometer has a few drops of our oxalate on it. We don't want to lose those because we've already measured those out precisely. So I'm just gonna run a little bit of water in there to, to wash those off. I'm gonna use as little water as possible because every water I put in at room temperature lowers the temperature of my solution. So this is ready to go. Now we need to record our burette reading. As I told you before, it doesn't need to be at zero. It can be somewhere near the top as long as we know what that is. So I wanna read that off. Notice that the burette has major lines every one milliliter, minor graduation lines every tenth of a milliliter. What that means is that we ought to be able to read this to one one hundredth of a milliliter where we're estimating that final one hundredths place. And so as I read this, it looks to me to be about 8.31 milliliters. I'm estimating that that hundredths place by noting that the, the liquid level is just below the three-tenths line. In this particular titration, I'm actually reading at the top of the liquid level. Normally you're taught always read volumes at the bottom of the meniscus. Because our, solu our solution is a dark purple color, it's very difficult to see the bottom of the meniscus, so we're going with the top of the solution. But I'm gonna go with 8.31 milliliters. Let me just write that on the board so that we don't forget. We'll need that later. You, of course, would be writing this in your notebook. Now, let's begin our titration. We've got the initial volume. We've got our, our oxalate solution heated so we can start. So I'm going to add a little bit at first, swirl it, Notice the pink persists for just a little bit, but it's going to go away. 
the color that is. And there it goes. It's a funny thing with this reaction. It's slow at first, but then it speeds up as we go. So that initial color took a little bit to disappear, but it did disappear, and now we'll be able to go faster. The reason for that is that the product of this reaction, the manganese ion, actually turns out to also be a catalyst for this reaction. So it'll go faster as you go. Okay. Now we're going to be adding the solution. You don't want to go too fast because you want to give that brown tint that forms a chance to disappear. You may have noticed that, that it goes from the purple color to kind of a brownish color. The brownish colors are other manganese oxides that we have to make sure that we get rid of. That's part of the reason that we heat this is to help get rid of those things. But we're going to keep titrating here. And because we know the approximate concentration of the unknown, we know that our permanganate is about 0 .2, 0 0.02 molar. We can estimate approximately what the volume is that it's going to be total. And I've done that. It's about 20 milliliters. As a little exercise on your own, you might want to see if you can repeat that calculation. So I know I've still got a ways to go here, but I'm going to continue to go it slow. Check my volume here, see how we're doing. We're a little below 18 now, so we are probably roughly halfway to where we need to be. In a titration, going too slow is better than going too fast, because you can always creep up onto your endpoint from the bottom. Once you've passed it, you can't go back. Notice too that I'm vigorously swirling the flask the entire time that I'm titrating. That helps to get the mixture going and get the reaction as efficient as possible. That's why it's always much better to do this type of titration in an Erlenmeyer flask rather than in a beaker because it's much easier to swirl things in a flask and not lose the material. Now it seems to me that that pink color is starting to take a little bit longer to disappear than it had been previously. And so at that point we want to be careful and slow down because that means we're starting to approach the end point of the titration. And judging by our volume here, we are now down to about 26 and a half mils. So that's pretty close to the 20 milliliter target that I told you was going to be the ballpark answer. So we want to start going pretty slowly here, perhaps a drop at a time. And we're looking for a persistent pink purple color, where we define persistent as lasting longer than about 30 seconds. And that should happen with a single drop. So we just have to patiently look for that drop. And there it is. There is our persistent pink color. So we have reached the end point of our titration. You want to pale as pink as possible. If you can get paler than what I've just gotten, more power to you. That's great. You want it as pale as possible. Any sign of color persistence means that you've reached the end point of the titration. So let's now measure what the final volume is in our burette. And we do that the same way. It helps oftentimes to read these if you put a background behind there. So I'm going to take a look at that. And it looks like 
the volume is about 28. It's just a hair below 28. It's not quite down to the next line. It's kind of tough to see. I'm going to call that about 28.05 milliliters. And I'll record that then as our final volume. And I also want to check the temperature of my solution here just to make sure that it hasn't gotten too cool. So I'm going to verify that my temperature is still reasonably high. Ideally, we'd like it to be above 60 degrees still. Looks like we're at about 40. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to warm it back up a little bit. And see if that color disappears. Because if it does, that means that we didn't quite hit it because it wasn't warm enough. So let me just warm that up for a minute or two and see if that color disappears. If it does, we might have to add another drop or two to finish our titration. Looks like the color is quite pleased to stick around. You see we're approaching 60 degrees now. We're almost at 60 and my pink color has still persisted. So I think that suggests that our titration is complete. So I think we're good to go. Okay, so now we've done the titration. You'll actually do this three times. I'll just do it once here during this illustration. But now we've done the titration. Now let's go over and see how we do the calculations. Let's see how we can take these titration data that we've collected and turn that into a concentration of our unknown permanganate solution. So the first thing we need to do now, remember a reaction occurs in a moles to moles basis. So our strategy here is to first calculate the number of moles of oxalate that were in the flask and then once we know that based on the stoichiometry of the reaction we can calculate the number of moles of permanganate that we added and then because we've measured the volume of the permanganate we can then calculate its concentration so the calculation goes something like this remember that we started with 10 milliliters which I'm going to convert that to liters so 10 milliliters is 0 0.01 liters so we started with 0.01 liters of a 0.10 molar solution of oxalate. So that calculation means that we have 0.0010 moles of the oxalate ion. That's the number of moles of oxalate that were in the flask. Now we use the stoichiometry of the reaction to convert that to moles per manganate added. So I'm going to write that out. 0 0.0010 moles of oxalate. And then you multiply that by the stoichiometric conversion factor, which in this case is 2 moles of permanganate per 5 moles of oxalate. So the 2 and the 5 are just the stoichiometric coefficients in the balanced chemical reaction. And if you do that calculation then what you find is that you have 0 0.00040 moles of permanganate added. 
Once we have the moles, all we need now is the total volume of permanganate that we added, and we have finished our calculation. That, of course, comes from our titration data. Earlier, I recorded the initial and the final volumes that were the burette reading. So, the total volume added is simply the difference between those two numbers. So we'll subtract those, 28.05, no, minus 8.31 is 19.74 milliliters. Now again, a molarity, which is what we're shooting for, is moles per liter. So we convert that volume to liters and we finish off the molarity calculation. 0 0.0040 moles divided by 0 0.01974 liters And the final concentration is 0 0.0203 moles per liter, or 0 0.0203 molar. That is our unknown permanganate concentration. So you guys will carry out this titration three times. Therefore, for each titration, you can calculate the concentration. And then you will report the concentration as the average value of those three experiments. That's it.